Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'd like to introduce Ben Peterson, who will talk about uh, their work on translation as a collaborative process, where uh, using, like, with the help of two monolingual um, speakers, um, may, tries to translate between two languages. And um, <clears throat> this is joint work with uh, Philip Resnick from University of Maryland. Uh, ben Peterson is a, a, a professor at um, University of Maryland too. Uh, he he works on human computer interaction, mobile inter interface devices. He is known for his uh, Zoom mobile interfaces work, and he was the director of the, uh, the usable lab there. And he's involved with the digital uh, children's library, international digital uh, children's library. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'll just leave the floor to him because we are already late. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Um, pleasure to be here. So um, right. You gave all the intro stuff that I needed to say, so let's just uh, dive right in. Um, the, uh, the need for this, the need for the research is fairly obvious, which is that we all know there's a lot of stuff out there in languages that we don't all speak. Um, that's sort of the obvious part. Um, the, uh, I have another personal motivation, which is uh, I'm just sort of hinted at, is I've been working for a number of years on a project called uh, the International Children's Digital Library, which is a um, website of children's books. I want to show you a little bit because it will help to motivate um, why I'm interested in monolingual translation. So um, this is the website, childrenslibrary.org, um, in which I should say is actually a Google partner. Um, uh, we are one of, I think, the only non-print library partner of uh, Google Books. Ramsey, our, one of our, our contact liaison from uh, Google Books is, uh, is, is here. So um, we have books in 60 plus languages. and. Uh, key characteristic is that it's a very child-friendly content and interface. We work very closely with children in the design of the interface. Um, you can see there's sort of an unusual uh, search mechanism. You can click on these uh, on facets, and uh, uh, there we have uh, actually a couple hundred facets. This interface uh, is the sort of the children's interface, so it has a select number of facets. We can look for, say, books that are blue and are sad. Uh, there's a visual representation of the search. You can actually do keyword search also, but that's sort of demoted, sort of very un um, <laughs> uh, These, There are books in eight languages that meet those characteristics. Uh, notice you can't do a zero hit query because we gray out the facets. Um, uh, that would result in no hits. And then we can go and uh, get a book, get a, um, the metadata. We have, um, well, for us, a lot of uh, volunteers, we've got about 2,000. 2,000 volunteers that are translating our metadata. So this book has metadata translated um, in lots of languages. Uh, and then you can go and see the book. One of the things we learned about how children select books is they like to do it, um, they like to have a feel of the book. Not only its physical characteristics, but how colorful it is, how many pictures there are. Right? Picture books are just different than textual books. And it's kind of a motivation for a lot of the stuff we do that you'll see runs through this talk. So we provide an overview, visual overview of the book. If there's a lot of pages here on a small screen, the overviews are very small, so it would give you a little pop-up with a slightly bigger version. And then finally, you get to read the book. And again, there's some differences with picture books because you can't just show the text. I mean, you guys also show the scan of the book, but for us, you even need to show two-page um, views of the book. And so, uh, um, so we do that. But the books are often not very readable. Uh, so we've done a lot of put a lot of effort into readability. Um, we pre-process the books, find where the text is, and then have a, what we call pop-out text, um, where we have an image of the um, of each text box that we um, serve separately. And that's particularly useful for um, books where there are um, artistic or special kinds of uh, text boxes. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to show you is that this is great for maintaining uh, artistic intent but not great for accessibility and translation. So, because those are images. So this, uh, our volunteers are now starting to translate our books. So this book has been translated into a few other languages. We can look at it in Romanian. So in order to do that and still keep the context of text and image, we've now done one more bit of image processing, removed the text from the image, and then rendered the text uh, um, with the browser on top of the underlying image. Right, so now I get now this gives us the potential for translation and accessibility. So that's sort of our context for um, saying, you know, where are we? We've, we, uh, if you go back to our um, simple search, reset this. You'll also see we have books in 
um, 60 odd languages and a lot of them are fairly uncommon uh, and we don't have volunteers that can translate between these 60 squared language pairs. So that's a problem. Um, I'll just also mention in passing, we also have done some mobile work. We have an, a mobile reader and also a mobile writer for kids creating storybooks. Take out, if you have an iPhone, check out Story Kit. It's kind of a new thing. It's kind of cool. great multimedia stories. Okay. Human translation, the biggest problem is actually the lack of availability. All the other stuff is a problem too. I just called um, a commercial company to try and get our website, an updated version of the website translated into Mongolian. And they say, no problem. You know, he said, you know, it's only, you know, whatever, a few thousand words. They said, we can do that for you in um, uh, just over a month. We're like, well, we were kind of thinking tomorrow, <laughs> right? Or maybe next week, uh, and it would be a few hundred dollars. So, right? And this is just from English to Mongolian. It's not even that uncommon. So the reality is um, human services, as you know, just doesn't work. Um, machine translation is great, but we want to do children's books. We want high quality, and uh, we're just not there. And even when you guys get there for, you know, English and Chinese and French, that's great. But what about, um, you know, Mongolian to Urdu? Um, that is, we'll always find language pairs for which MT is not going to, I think we've got a little bit of time yet before we can rely on that. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. So let's take a different tack. Let's take advantage of human computation, right? We know the world is now... Uh, um, uh, letting humans solve our hard problems for us. The problem is, of our tons and tons of human volunteers, the number of humans that actually have the skills that we need are tiny. And so it's great. You know, we actually have, you know, depending on how much they do, one or two thousand volunteers for our, for our children's digital library. Um, but that's not very much. And the reality is, of course, of most of, the, even of those one or two thousand people, the number of people that are actually actively Translating is relatively small percentage of that, and the number of language pairs that that covers is even smaller. So what we need to do is figure out how to take advantage of the resources that are really available, which are people that speak one language, and there's plenty of those. Okay, so if we look at this um, very rough chart of how translation happens in the world now, we've got our machine translation, which is you know, relatively low quality, our professional translation, which is highest quality, and um, this kind of uh, uh, wiki translation or mechanical Turk translation, which is somewhere in the middle. And what we're hoping is that we can do this magic and somehow get these masses of people that speak one language to get us better quality and reasonable affordability. So that's my, that's my goal is to try and convince you that it might be possible to do this. So let's just jump right in and I'm gonna show you the solution. Fill in the details. There has been a long, uh, plenty of work um, thinking about how a human on the destination end, on the, on the target side, can take the result of machine translation and fix it up. Right? And that's called post-editing. So if we had some, uh, uh, some source language speaker, say French, go through a translation channel and have the target speaker, say English, fix it up, you would get something that was better than just the empty output. Right? And uh, so what we are proposing to do is to go a step further and to say, well, that's not good enough. So maybe we can now use the source speaker, use our source speakers to actually help in, con in concert with the target speakers and have some kind of communication support to let you go back and forth and have a multi-pass process to, to try and improve the, the target. Um, uh, and in addition to just relying on going, having these humans go back and forth across this translation channel, we're envisioning this enrichment channel where you have, uh, can have not only pure text, but also take advantage of what other, other resources, whatever other resources you have, whether they're pointing to images um, on the web, links, or perhaps even support some kind of structured Q&A where you're not relying on pure natural language because it may be that the kind of questions that people ask to support translations is, is stereotyped enough that you don't need um, completely open uh, and, uh, communication channel. Yeah. Does this include chat or IM as well, or is it just offline communication? So, um, uh, so 
it's only this that's a perfect lead into a little bit of a metadata I wanted to say. So where we are with this is where this is a very early part of the project. We actually just got a little bit of funding from Google to support this. So thank you. Ocon is our is our sponsor for this. Um, but uh, uh, we in, uh, so today's talk is really kind of a model and a very early prototype. Um, so actually, one of the things I want to do is leave plenty of time for your suggestions about how to make this how to move forward. Um, we currently have our current prototype is a real time community or not real time not quite real time communication between uh, two people. Uh, I think that this concept of this protocol could I, we envision it having several different modalities. One could be sort of with some IM with a translation channel in the middle. One is offline between two people, and one is sort of bag of tasks where you go out and use Mechanical Turk or some resource like that to get people to do tiny little bits. And I think uh, one of the interesting questions is which is the right balance between throughput and quality. So don't know yet. Thanks. Or yes, all. Of them. All right, so let's go through an example. Um, this is an actual example from uh, some people that participated in a pilot study that were, um, uh, this was done before a prototype. Um, I don't really speak French, so I hesitate to say this, but I will. Um, so on the source side, you might say, en général, on s'entend bien tous les deux. And it comes out with Google Translate as, in general, it means well both. And so now the person, the English speaker on the target side might try and fix that up and say, well, I think uh, that sounds a little bit awkward. Let me change that in general. It's about both of us. It goes back through MT to the source side, and now it says en général, il est à la, à la croix de nous. Um, the source speaker recognizes there is a little bit of a um, uh, potential problem here, so they replace this verb with a reflexive verb, and then adds this um, enrichment channel data. So they take um, this part en général and say this thing, this part of the sentence seems to be translated well. So we're going to mark this as being correct. And this part seems to be having a bit of a problem, so we're going to attach a picture to that clause that shows um, uh, uh, two friends. And so then that comes across. The target speaker sees this information. Uh, they leave this alone and say, maybe this is a hint that I'm, there's something wrong with the way this is being translated. So I'll turn this into friends. We say, in general, we are good friends. It gets translated back. And now, finally, they have. Uh, uh, there's some extra, there's some interface that lets the um, participants propose that it's done. And so one of the challenges here is to understand when you are done. You know, there's actually, um, I've gotten an email from about five different people in the last two days pointing me to translation party. I'm sure you guys have all seen this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, right, one of our challenges is to recognize, uh, is to avoid these, these recursive uh, these recursive digressions into bad, badness. Um, and to, so this is uh, it's an interesting challenge because right, this is we're trying to do something that seems sort of fundamentally impossible, which is get two people that don't speak a word of the same language to to result to do something result in high quality translation. All right, so let's take a step back. In order to do this kind of translation, we have to think about what kind of errors we're likely to see. And we're motivated very loosely by information theory, where we think of uh, translation as communication across a noisy channel, where the key idea is that if there is uh, redundancy in your source data, then you will have a chance of actually recognizing that there are errors in your resultant communication and even fixing it. So there's Roughly speaking, three kinds of errors, those that you can detect and correct, those you can detect and not correct, um, and things that you don't even recognize that there's a problem in the first place. And of course, those are really tough. Um, so let's just look at these three cases in this context of monolingual translation and see how it works. So the first easy kind, um, you've got a sentence, tout le monde doit entendre l'histoire de Cendrillon, it comes across as everybody has here story about Cinderella, you recognize, native speaker recognizes that that's not quite right. Um, there's some kind of conflict between, uh, in tense, and so they turn this into everybody has heard, and uh, uh, and it works. So along the way, we've done a few different uh, pilot studies uh, to try and tease out how um, how each of the elements that we're trying to take advantage of might work. Um, these were really small pilot studies. Uh, we had 25 sentences in Chinese, random sentences which are from Wikipedia. 
um, used uh, some MT systems to print them into English, and then used post editing. Had had one or I think two humans post edit it. Uh, we put them through two different uh, machine translation systems, and sure enough, you can see that post editing uh, seems to result in uh, well, does result in a pretty big improvement uh, based on uh, TER translation editor rate, which is an automatic metric for closeness of the result to the ground truth. 80, 80, 88% so that meant 9 out of 10 words were edited? Correct. Because so the TER is, uh, is this... Uh, it's, ah, it's not HTR, it's it's TR. Okay. Yeah. So it was not done uh, by a human, but... Uh, Correct. Okay. So right, this means that uh, it may have been that the translation was okay, but it wasn't the one that was close to the ground truth. Makes sense. Okay, so the bottom line is this makes us think that there is enough redundancy that you can get some get some value out of it, which is just consistent with that with literature. So that's fine. All right, so a little bit more interesting is uh, those errors that are detectable but not correctable. So you recognize something's wrong, but you don't quite know how to fix it. So it's the same source sentence, and it comes across. You see, everybody has heard the business by Cinderella. So maybe that's okay, but maybe it just seems a little bit weird. So you're you just have a you know raises a flag and say I'd like to ask about the business. Um, what? So uh, the problem is, of course, you are hesitant to just ask them a question because you can't communicate right directly. And if you ask them through the, the MT system, your question might uh, um, be be a problem. So if we can't use this naive solution, what do we do? And this brings up this general question of how to communicate through unreliable MT systems. And as I mentioned earlier, one approach is to use uh, what we call an enrichment channel or metadata um, uh, of other kinds, other kinds of information that are less likely to be problematic. But we still have to be able to connect the um, relevant parts of the language on both sides. And fortunately, um, we know how to do that. You may recognize this, Okan. This is from <laughs> an image I stole from his uh, dissertation at Maryland. Uh, uh, and the idea is we can use uh, alignment, which is right the connection between words across languages, uh, to uh, project project other kinds of information. So the this picture is showing that um, on the top, um, if these words are aligned, blue and bleu, house and maison, maison, then if Blue is an, is an adjective modifying house, and we know that in English, we can infer that blue is an adjective modifying maison. Um, so we can do the same kind of uh, the same kind of thing. Where now, what we want to do is just take this um, uh, phrase on the right, the business by, and add some metadata, which is saying, you know, I'm I I'm just confused. Can you help me out on this? Right, seeing a single bit of information is helpful. And then it comes across on the destination side, right, on the matching bit of text. And now they can attach an image. Since l'histoire in French can mean something like story-ish or something like business, they get an image that means story. And so now this comes across um, uh, back to the target speaker side with a picture of, of, of a story. And that gives them a better chance of um, figuring out what was going on. So we did a second pilot where we um, this was still this was a wizard this was a Wizard of Oz simulation at this point where we use those same sentences but now we let uh, uh, them go back and forth and ask questions where the questions themselves went through MT so that this was a case where um, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot right where we knew that the questions were going to be translated and the answers would be translated badly but we figured if there was any improvement here then we could certainly do better than this. And so um, what this is showing is T0 was the original MT. T1 was the result of post-editing. Then went back to the source speaker and came back. This was the result of it going a round trip. Actually got slightly improved. And then uh, post-editing a second, second round with whatever metadata they had added uh, gave us another few percent. So it was not a huge improvement, but it's in the right direction. And as I said, this was a... Uh, The not best the solution that we might have. Yeah. Do you know what percentage of the data was post editable, i.e., meta could be associated with some metadata? Like, I would imagine not everything you can attach pictures to it, right? 
Right. So uh, I don't have any data to answer your question. I will tell that our we've done. You'll see we've done several experiments. I'll show you as we go along. One of the things that we've learned is that. Um, Unfortunately, the kinds of things that pictures work best for are the things, not surprisingly, that are least likely to have problems. Right, because they're often the nouns and uh, you know simpler concepts. Uh, but nevertheless, there are still ambiguities where pictures can help, and um, uh, and we're not really not only limited only to pictures. Actually, there's the the richer the world becomes, the better off this approach works. Right, if you just even find a Wikipedia page that's been translated. You can just point to you know, your version of the Wikipedia page, hope that somebody else has translated that Wikipedia page relatively correctly, and that'll give you some information that might help. So this kind of, uh, right, it's, there's a lot of randomness in there, but the point is there is this information in the world, and any kind of information that we can get uh, uh, might help. But I don't have any data on that. And you mentioned, like, for the example, you use uh, story, for instance, for ambiguous stuff. Even doing something simple like um, if you have a bilingual dictionary, and the problem is ambiguity, right? But if you list all the possible translations for that word, the other side can, use, like given the context, can do a better job. That's, that's right. So right. as I said, this is very, really early in our prototype. So absolutely. Of course, we assume there'll be an online dictionary. And so it could be that if you have any question, rather than just saying I have a question, you have an online, the online dictionary might even be more clever. It could go back to the source, get all of the definitions, and then translate each of those definitions and uh, say which, I'm confused, it says this, but I'm, I'm you sure this is the right one, and they can go back on the source side and say, actually, it's this definition. So yeah, there's all kinds of places where we're expecting that interface design, um, a dynamic interface design dr driven by the underlying data as much as there is will be helpful. Which is why I should mention, I should mention this up front, um, for those of you who don't know that my collaborator, Philip Resnick, is a long time uh, you know, computational linguist, and I'm a long time HCI person, neither of us having really done much in the other. So this is, right, I'm way out of my league here, so I'm sure it's going to become apparent as we talk about these details. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is I think the ways and the, the way that this can work is precisely when you do marry um, the, all of the underlying uh, linguistic understanding with the best possible, you know, rich, interactive, fast uh, um, user experience. Okay, so the impossible kind. Um, uh, you get a sentence that looks just great. It's grammatically correct. It's you know somewhat reasonable within the context, and there's no reason to think that there's any error at all. So what can you possibly do about that? Um, and uh, this is a tricky one. Um, at first glance, the answer is nothing. And we, when we started thinking about it this way, we were like, you know, this is a bad. This whole research idea is a bad thing. We should not be doing this, <laughs> right? Um, then we realized, actually, there are some things we can do, right? If, if our general feeling is that redundancy, or not our feeling, we know that having redundancy helps, let's just think about where can we get more redundancy from. So a simple kind of redundancy is just to have different um, machine translation systems, right? Um, you could certainly use different, I mean, there are, there's lots of different machine translation systems in the world. And they have different underlying processes and different underlying data that's built them, and they're likely to have some different kinds of data. So there's a chance you'll get uh, different results that might help you out. And if you do, that might bring you down to level two, where you at least recognize that there's an error, and then you can go back to using your communication mechanism to try and fix it. So we did our third pilot and uh, used. Uh, we had already used Google and Babelfish separately, and now what we did is we gave, um, uh, we used them together. So strangely enough, even the automatic system did better than either one, um, and that is just by uh, looking, taking the best result of either Google or Babelfish. And basically, what this means is every once in a while, Babelfish did better than Google. But the um, selection is, is well, Oracle. You, you, yeah, yeah. Well, only this is if you have an Oracle. To right, right. Oh, okay. Right, so that's not quite. Anyway, there's, 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 the point is that there's more information even by combining these two things. But the really interesting thing is that we just get a, we're using a human, well, a human is an oracle, right? So that's, that's legitimate. When we gave both translations to a human and just had them select, uh, use both of them to construct the best thing, then they had a pretty significant improvement. So more parallel channels is better. Um, 
Turns out there's other things we so can do. So the oh. humans here, do they always just see one sentence and make the decision on one sentence? Well, or do they see whatever they see in context? And so in this pilot, they only saw one sentence. Which, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh, this is a constrained task, right? Sort of the nature of these doing these experiments, right? You try to get something that you can pin a number on, but it doesn't mean that but these are the worst. You can, you can always do better than those. So there's lots of other ways to get redundant information. One is show context. So at the very least, show the sentences around that sentence you're trying to translate. In the context of a picture book, by all means, show the text in the context of the picture, right? That picture probably contains, you know, in many, many children's books, it'll contain half the information. Right? So that's a tremendous amount of value. Uh, and there's something you can do that's even stranger, which is, uh, you know, this goes against, I think, the natural way of thinking of things, because we normally try and do things inexpensively. But our goal here is, is, I will say that our first goal is to do things with high quality, and our second goal is to do things inexpensively, right? Because we're trying to just get to a place where we can use these translations where we couldn't otherwise use it. So what you could do is you could have the source language speaker paraphrase or just right, say the same thing in a different way every single time, right? And then translate that paraphrase. Um, and that seems outrageously expensive to take all of your material and get a human to say it again. But on the other hand, right, if we have uh, um, hundreds of thousands of participants uh, where they're monolingual speakers and you can engage them. And I'm not asking, haven't yet asked the question of how we can engage them, right? It's another important question. But if we make this either fun or we make this useful to them or we build this into their normal activities, I don't think it's actually that unreasonable that we're going to be able to get this kind of participation in one form or another, uh, at least in some contexts. Uh, and that's probably going to be the best kind of uh, redundant information that will help us convert these undetectable errors into detectable errors. Um, OK. Uh, all right, so this more or less makes that point. All right, so we did um, <clears throat> a couple more experiments. First, we did. What, we'd done all those pilot experiments that looked at each of these individual sort of elements, and then we wanted to put it together and say, okay, if we had this whole system, would it work? So we did a Wizard of Oz experiment uh, before we had built any technology. We had a um, kind of a structural challenge because we didn't want bias by the participants to be able to have a um, common language because they might be able to infer something about it or within the, within the experiment. So we had participant that spoke French and English, and another participant that spoke Turkish and English, and we had a Wizard of Oz in the middle that spoke all three languages. And the participants never used English in the task, so that wasn't the problem. Um, uh, so um, we just did a very small amount of this. It took an hour to do five sentences, in which they finished two. And so this made us nervous, because we're thinking, OK, well, we showed sort of conceptually that this might work, but in practice, it's a complete loser. because. Um, uh, it was going to take so long. And well, what happened is, so we got nervous at first, but as we started to think about it and look at what happened, we realized that a lot of the time spent was avoidable. First of all, we had people in different rooms, and the Wizard of Oz was running back and forth and like typing stuff into Google Translate. And so there was a lot of overhead that we could avoid. Um, and the other thing is that people, a lot of the result will depend on the instructions that you give to people. We had given people the instructions of trying to make excellent, high-quality translation. And so as a result, they would sometimes spend five minutes on a single side scratching their head and wondering whether they should use this or uh, you know, and really trying to make it exactly perfect and going back and forth. And uh, I think that with a uh, fine-tuning this sort of quality speed trade-off based on how we motivate people and instruct them, we can get that speed way, way, way down to, and still get reasonable results. So uh, we built a prototype, which I'll warn you was very, very rough. Um, uh, uh, but to show you what it looks like, I am going to attempt with my um, graduate student, Chang, who is in, hopefully sitting in his uh, computer in Maryland to try and translate something. All right. 
So um, we're going to, I'm, I actually am going to do this scripted just so uh, um, I've got a fighting chance of making this work while thinking on my feet. It's not a good sign, but I guess, okay. So this is a book that, um, actually, it's actually the same book I showed you, but we're going to actually start from Chinese. We have a... So we're in this case, we're going from Chinese to English, and just ignore the fact that this book was originally written in English. Um, so uh, you start off by seeing uh, in the current view of the page, the current best translation in English. And if you read through this, you'll see that some of this looks good and some of this looks um, uh, slightly funky. Um, you can, uh, when you mouse over edit, you'll see what is the, um, uh, which sentences are ready for um, you to do some work. So all these green ones are ready for me. That is right, because they go back and forth. So this is now ready for me on the English side. So I'm going to pick um, uh, 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 this sentence. Everyone read the story of Cinderella. And then what I'll get is, slowly, OK, this is the last, uh, the last edit of this sentence from Chinese to English. OK, um, I'm a little confused. All oh, right, normally you see um, uh, an image of the section of the book with that sentence, so you can see the image, but because this that's not here because this book was actually translated into Chinese for this experiment. But normally that would be there. And now here's my interface. Uh, we kind of do this kind of like S or snake shaped curve back and forth. Source is always on the left, translation is always on the right. Um, and so now I can take this and either tag any portion of it or edit it. So I'll go over here and change everyone uh, has read the story of Cinderella. I can now say I think this translation is finished. I give up or send to partner. Um, uh, I'm going to send this to partner. I think I might have just clicked on something. All right, so now this is the current best sentence, right? It's not green right now because it's not uh, available for me to do anything with. Uh, but as soon as my partner has, uh, then we can. And this also brings up the challenge of the real-time nature of this, right? I said in the experiment, people would spend five minutes, but even if this is working well and takes one minute, right, you're going to, even if you're working with somebody, even if you know them, you're not going to want to be doing this in real time back and forth. So uh, I think we need to design this interface much better for having much less waiting and uh, let you, I mean, yeah, I actually can go through and do any other sentence. Um, uh, and then come back to that one, but our workflow right now is a little bit funky. I recognize that we need to figure. We need to. We need to but you can imagine it. finishing all the green stuff without waiting. Yeah, yeah, I can. Do, I can do all the green stuff to, to do that without waiting. So, I, this is such a little girl story. So maybe I go edit this to say this is. Um, uh, this is a story of such a little girl, something like that. And just to show you how this works, maybe we want to tag. Right. Um, I can select some, some text. It's using the Google uh, Research um, Translate API to um, uh, give me alignment across the language. And now, at the moment, all we can do is do an image or text. But I can um, do an image search. Normally, you can do, I think it'll eventually come up. I'm not sure why it's being slow right now. You can do an image search, do it, right, have an embedded search, take the image, and then just associate it with that text. And then that, and then that image will show up on both sides. All right. I think, um, what did they give us? OK, anyway, that's what it would look like for those Ruby images. I think uh, you get the idea. Um, let's, let's keep on going. But uh, uh, So uh, that's what the prototype currently looks like. 
Um, we did a slightly more real evaluation on this prototype, finally without a Wizard of Oz, um, um, going between Russian and Chinese. And in this case, they were able to work about um, six pages, 44 sentences is an hour, so still slow, um, but on the right trajectory. So I think if we can get you know five times faster again, then uh, we would be in you know, reasonable shape. Uh, but what's interesting is the results. So we had a uh, bilingual translator judge the resultant sentence both the both the resultant sentences of our protocol and just the original MT output for both fluency and accuracy um, so the light green is the MT output and you can see that there's kind of a hump down low which is bad and for the um, prototype uh, the hump is towards the right in fact we had a good chunk of things on the right um, it's actually a little surprising that this there was so much that wasn't completely fluent mm -hmm. Um, and I haven't looked at the data close enough to know exactly why, but I'm just guessing that it's uh, um, uh, just mis inconsistent judgments among our participants and our expert speakers. Um, still, I wouldn't expect it to be that so high, so not quite, I can't quite explain that. Um, but what's really, what's really positive and encouraging is that the, um, on the accuracy, we started off with accuracy sort of being in the middle and a little bit all over the map, and after the result of running through this prototype, uh, it went way to the right. right. So that's good. In fact, if you look at these results of 28 sentences that were translated, the number of sentences that were bad, say one or two, dropped from 12 to 4, and the number that are good, rated 4 or 5, uh, jumped from 7 to 19. So uh, with all kinds of caveats and our, our system clearly having a lot of room for improvement, it seems like there's the potential for this to give us certainly higher quality. And so what it's going to come down to is how consistently, how um, fast can this work, how painful is it for humans to participate, and how to right, make this, uh, so it's how do we come up with a way of making this fun or engaging or part of their, their normal activities. Um, so let me just wrap up. I tell you where we're going. Uh, I think we've learned enough about this uh, the interface and this UI that we'll throw it away and rebuild it. I've become a recent convert of GWT, so I think I'm, make, I'm making all my students use GWT now, um, unless someone tells me not to. <laughs> but it's been working well for me. Um, uh, we need to get more languages. Uh, we're currently using the, the research API, which only gives us alignment and, and best of a few languages. So I don't know if there's any way to give us access to. It, it should. It, sh it should work for all 51. If, if it doesn't work, it might maybe only says it works for some, but if you try it for all 51, that oh, that was a, that's a huge bit of information to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that API doesn't get a lot of usage, and so we haven't maintained it as well as we should. Um, but you think, but the intention is to have it do all languages. Yeah, if, if it doesn't. Um, I'll fix it. It's, oh, that's uh, fantastic. Great. That's uh, and uh, Don't be discouraged by the documentation. <laughs> okay. Right. No, it's working well. I mean, there's, yeah. there's no reason it shouldn't support all, all right. that. And as you can see, right, I mean, we were able to integrate this into our app, and that so it worked that's great. well. So that's cool. And we're using alignment. We're not yet using the invest, but we're expecting that we will. Well, um, the, the Russian Chinese experiment, what kind of metadata did you use? Did you use uh, pictures and what else? I think people, I mean, I actually don't. Uh, I don't know exactly what was used. I can find out. I don't know. I did not, I did not look at the Just results. as a side note, this uh, talk is being recorded and will be publicly available. Oh. So. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. And the, um, uh, I can't find out. The uh, We just wrote this up as a paper that we submitted to Kai last week. So we kind of did the experiment on Wednesday afternoon and finished writing it on Thursday and submitted it Friday morning. So um, Chang knows, but I don't know. <laughs> Actually, he's online, so we can ask some questions. Um, of course, one of the side goals of this, it's not our principal goal, but a natural part of this, is if this model starts to get used with any volume, we then start to build really good new sets of matched uh, data, which, of course, naturally feeds into MT systems. right? And this is always, of course, a second best to having good quality MT. So right? I think that I, my, my vision for the world is that there's going to be some version of this, right, some version of human participation to improve quality in some way, uh, to improve MT systems where you need high quality. And then as you get more and more of these things, 
right? MT will get good enough, the human participation will decrease, and you'll just switch to more and more language pairs. And there's enough language pairs that we can just keep at this for a long time. Um, so, just sort of taking a step back to close, we think about this work as being a bit of a um, investigating a new space in this quality affordability trade-off by using human participation. It begs the question of, okay, well, it might work for translation, but where else can humans help you to help solve hard problems? And of course, there's a whole field of um, what's sometimes called human computation, or I call distributed human computation. We actually just wrote a, submitted the second paper to Kai. Um, trying to look at this field um, more broadly and wrote a taxonomy sort of summarizing uh, how we see the field of human computation going and identified several uh, dimensions in these columns that you have to consider whenever you're building a distributed human computation system, such as what motivates the people to participate, what kind of quality can you expect to get, and how can you design your system to result in better quality and avoid people that are gaming or trying to make money from you. Um, how do you aggregate the results? What kind of human skills do you require? Um, uh, what's the minimum amount of time does it take to participate? Because that's crucial, right? If it's very long, you're going to have much smaller participation. And how much effort does it take? You know, certain kinds of tasks that really take you to require you to focus are probably going to be harder to get participation. And then there's all of these different categories of, of DHC. You know, the most obvious one, which of course you guys know well, is games with the purpose and move on on. Um, and that's super important and valuable, but it's really only one kind of way that people are harnessing humans uh, to do hard stuff. Um, so the uh, mono translation that I'm talking about now is really a, it's sort of a form of crowdsourcing. As I mentioned, we're envisioning repackaging it as mechanized labor in the future. Um, and I think there's even a potential of repackaging it as dual purpose work, which is the idea that you integrate it into people's um, existing workflows. So you do some, take, right, there, you get exactly the people that you want to do what they're already doing. Um, show you just a, a motivational demo that's really more for me, as much than for you guys, but this is a um, uh, beginnings of my, my sort of explorations of using Wave. Um, uh, not surprising, my first app is a uh, ICDL reader. Um, it's my first app for everything. So uh, here's a wave with a with a with a an ICDL gadget, which is um, uh oh, <laughs> that's an unusual behavior. Oh, it's, I, this, I'm going to call this a wave bug. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've actually seen this happen in wave. Before. It's a developer. No, that's good. Bugs are good. I'm definitely not showing you a movie. Um, <laughs> all right. So it, actually, you saw it came back to the same state. So I'm showing the page number. I'm using the page number as uh, shared state, which is kind of interesting because now that lets me log on um, with a different account. In fact, with a different, uh, you know, uh, let's see if I can get this here. Um, wait, how do I do picture this? This has to be on the bottom. This has to be on the top. There we go. OK. Um, right, so now I can use the shared state to have a, um, a, social, a social reader. Uh, and then I can even do something like say, OK, well, I'm sort of envisioning this being used in a class participation where maybe you have 30 kids that maybe are in the same group setting, or maybe they're not in the same setting. Uh, and so one group decides, or one kid gets a little behind, so they want to back up. But they know if they back up, he's going to drive everybody backwards. So he just says, I want to unsync. And now they can back up, right, uh, or you know, explore or look wherever they want. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the class might be uh -oh. um, the rest of the class might be continuing to move forward. Um, uh, and so when this one comes back and says, "I want to resync with the class," then it comes back to where everybody else is, right? So I think it's actually pretty cool, um, and I'm pursuing Wave. But the reason it's interesting in this context is that's the only part of the plan. That's, that's the only part I've implemented. But the second part of the plan is to have another set of gadgets underneath, which are your activity gadgets. right? And the activity gadgets might be sort of teaching gadgets, such as like a vocabulary list for this page, or maybe a specialized discussion, or maybe a game. Maybe there's a word find. Or 
maybe this is in the context of a linguistics class, and so you want to maybe take a translation class, and so you're teaching translation and let the kids do those translation activities, right, right integrated into their reading activity. Um, and so, you know, teachers are looking for all kinds of interesting activities, and we have, uh, we actually have people that are using ICDL in classrooms around the world for all different kinds of things, some for translating. So we've had this teacher in Romania that has decided to start using her kid, use the ICDL to teach their kids English by letting them translate the books into English. They split the class into half, have one half translate, the other half check, and the other one, all right, do that in two different books. But, uh, so they could, she could use this kind of tool within her context, but even more interesting, teachers also always love to have cross-cultural, you know, pen pal -y kind of collaborations. So let's build tools where we have uh, monolingual kids across the world participate in reading and communicating and translating these books. And, uh, you know, I, the reason I want to go through this depth to think about this example is I know when I first started thinking about this project, I said, well, okay, this is all a theoretical construct, but you're never going to get the hundreds of thousands of participants you need to scale this up. And I agree it's a major challenge, but I also think that it is totally possible if we do creative uh, ways of integrating these tasks into things that people are doing. And education is a huge one. And if you look at sites like um, uh, where's the other one, Mochi, what's the Mochi translation site? Live Mocha, Live Mocha, not Mochi. Uh, eat Mochi, <laughs> drink Mocha. Um, so Live Mochi is a language learning site, and they claim to have, I think, like three million participants for people to help each other study language. Right? Let's build tools like this to get those folks to um, help us translate whatever it is that we want translated, and uh, there's a lot of potential. Okay. So, um, so to end, I just have one last little thought experiment, which is if we think about distributed human computation as being, thinking about ways to get humans and computers to collaborate, I would argue that almost every single example that I've seen all put humans in one lump. But the interesting, one of the interesting things about what we've done with this model translation is we've split the humans into two lumps, each with very different skill sets, and use the compute the computer as a way to mediate those skills and take advantage of them where they wouldn't be able to participate by themselves. And this now just you know, actually just begs the question of uh, where else can we take advantage of human skills by recognizing that there's different skills that can be harnessed more effectively if we're you know, even, even extra more creative in thinking about how to do that. And that'll stop, so thanks very much. Thank you. We have five more minutes, so if anybody has any questions, we can, we can do question and answer, or we can just head out to lunch. One of the things in translating any kind of story would be important to put the tone of a paragraph, for example. You make a Cinderella story where it's all light and happy, or it can make it really dark. Is there a way of, the, of putting that in here, do you think, that would make translations more feasible? Right, that's an interesting one. So the question is, right, how do you support, I'll call it affect, right, mm -hmm. right into the translation. In fact, one of the, I have to think while I'm answering, one of the things that came up a lot while we started, when, as we started thinking about this project is, as, as you all know, um, Translating is is an art, right? In fact, you can have the same book that's been published a tra and you know translated get retranslated because somebody felt like it was a perfectly fluent and accurate translation, but essentially without the tone or the affect that I wanted. It wasn't you know having just the right message. It was not as poetic. It had a different uh, perspective. Um, uh, so that's a really tough question, is how do you use, we want to think about integrating the richness of human language, and certainly including humans is the way to do it. Um, so that's, I mean, so the real answer is, of course, we haven't thought about that at all. Um, but maybe you could envision 
uh, having different paths. So once you've gone down with a translation, you could then um, go down, just like there's sort of these you know, wiki translations, uh, you could have something where you could say explicitly, we're trying to translate this with a certain, with a certain vision, a more poetic vision, some, and also, you, maybe you want to keep the poetic style, or maybe you want to change the style, or maybe it has a political connotation, which you want to keep or avoid. Um, so it sort of implies that you might want to have some metadata in your overall direction of what you're trying to accomplish with that translation. Um, then, of course, getting your participants to agree and follow that is an additional challenge. Um, so uh, it, it's a really good question, but it's so hard, I, I, we're not there yet. For the children's book translation, did you also look at what the quality of the story then afterwards? Because I guess looking at fluency and adequacy is one thing, but just it's that story. Overall. Would you really want to show that story then uh, uh, in in Turkish to children, and is it is it understandable overall? I, uh, so if we did this study on Thursday. I think that's Monday's work. <laughs> no, it's, you're absolutely. Of course, you're absolutely right. It's crucial. Um, I think again, we're this is as I said, this is really the beginning of this project, and we're just not there yet. I don't, I do not know, um, and I fully suspect that the way that we've set up this interface, the translations really, even though you can see those sentences, they largely were done sentence by sentence, and so you're likely to get some discontinuity. Um, and I think one of the things we have to do is I mean, we do have the overall um, page, but. I'm not. Sh I don't. Th my feeling is we're not currently using the interface well to support translation of the story, and there's a real trade-off in balancing this translation of the story versus turning these into small digestible tasks so that you're more likely to get people to participate. Because so, it, it could very well be, I guess, that the individual sentences are not correctly translated. They would all, all be rated rated not really adequate or so. But the story that comes out by someone that just polishes it then afterwards and makes it fit to the picture might be a perfect children's story with I don't know, slightly different events and, right. and uh, <laughs> but it's a story with a, a story. interesting yeah. funny, it would be a story uh, that went with the pictures it right. would be a slightly different story. Right. Like, um, so I think we kind of just like we did these. I think we have to do those kinds of experiments on the the whole stories, and then there'll be quality of stories, and then there's going to be I guess accuracy. Maybe there's a third one, which is the story quality, which is totally separate, as you're saying, from the accuracy compared to. You could also imagine the exact opposite, where this, each individual sentence is translated very literally, so it's very accurate, but the story itself is not particularly fluent. And in that direction, it's like to translate something with the big bad wolf into Swahili. A wolf might not make sense, but an African animal might. Right, so that so happens all the time when you have, right, that's the nature of this sort of artistic characteristic of translations, where you know even names. Sometimes you will translate the name in, if there's a if there's a culturally appropriate name, Juan into John or something, right? And other times you'll want to keep that name. Uh, how do you decide whether to do that? I know that's really I'll call that a creative decision. So that is not really a right answer. I assume you haven't even thought about things like poetry. Yeah, poetry. Well, I mean, children's books already are harder than wiki pages. So, uh, yeah. no. I mean, because there is some bit of, you know, poetry in, in just in the style of this writing. Actually, we picked a particularly hard book, The Blue Sky. Actually, I highly recommend you reading it. It's a beautiful, beautiful book about a sad book about a woman who loses um, her mother. Um, but it's uh, it's physically beautiful, and the, uh, the story is really beautiful book. But yeah, obviously you can get into more and more difficult sources, and uh, I don't have any answers for how this is going to be. So I hope you'll, some of you will join me for lunch to think about how we should pursue this and, and how it might fit into, you know, uh, how this can be helpful to, to you guys moving forward. It's, you know, I know it's a different take than most of what Google does, but not all of it, by any means. Especially with, um, I tried uh, Picasso's, uh, new um, face recognition app uh, came out a couple days ago, and it's amazing, and it works incredibly well. And I think that's a perfect example of you know, the kind of ways that you have to get engaged humans, right? You get them to do stuff that they want to do because it's valuable to them. And then that's gonna be. We are out of time, so we can continue chatting.
during lunch. Let's thank Ben again.